Good afternoon. Uh, today <clears throat> is, we will uh, begin our discussions of human biology with uh, chapter one in your textbooks. This chapter is entitled Exploring Life and Science. <clears throat> Excuse me. And these are the two uh, biggest themes of our course for the semester. Um, <clears throat> of course, biology is defined as the study of life. And so, um, you know, humans are a part of the biosphere, the living portion of the earth. Um, but of course, we're unique in many respects. We are, um, uh, we, we have the ability to reason. We have the ability to understand causal relationships, cause and effect uh, relationships. And we also uh, have the ability to affect and manipulate the world around us. We have the ability to change the temperature of a room or, um, you know, move various things, build structures that most other organisms don't actually have. Science is also uh, an important aspect of this course. Of, uh, obviously, it's a science course, but science is uh, how humans learn about the world around us. Now, the first thing that we need to talk about in this video is or are the characteristics of life, all right? And they'll be popping up on the screen as we uh, speak here, but um, all living organisms are organized, all right? And we are organi organized in a hierarchy from the smallest aspect, which is the atom, all the way up to the biosphere, which is the portion of the earth that sustains life. Now, these um, this idea of organization is very important. And we're gonna, the course will be designed such that we start at the atomic level and work our way up through the level of the biosphere. Second major characteristic of life is that all organisms acquire materials and energy. All right, how do we do that? Well, we do that in a variety of different ways. Um, animals obviously eat food right, and take in uh, nutrients. And right? so we acquire materials and energy from the environment around us. Things like plants do uh, photosynthesis using the energy of the sunlight to produce materials. The next uh, thing on the list is that all organisms are homeostatic. Now, homeostasis is probably the most important definition that you'll learn this semester. As a matter of fact, I promise you that the first question on your uh, final exam is going to be to define homeostasis and give me examples of it. We'll get to that again uh, a little bit later on. <clears throat> but um, homeostasis is essentially maintaining a balance, an equilibrium, um, not only inside of our bodies, but around us as well. Organisms must respond to stimuli, all right? If somebody uh, throws something at you, throws a rock at your head or, or uh, you know, throws a baseball at you, you have, to, you have to respond to that, all right? You can either reach up and catch the baseball or you can duck uh, if somebody throws a rock or, or something else, all right? If you put your hand down on a hot stove, you remove it very quickly so that you don't, uh, uh, sustain too much damage from the hot stove. Uh, all organisms reproduce and grow. Now, the reproduction part is not a necessary part of life. It's um, based on uh, previous history. I would guess that most of you probably haven't reproduced yet, um, but you will, um, or may maybe you won't, who knows. Um, but you have grown. You started out as a single cell in your mother's womb, um, and you ended up developing into the person that you are today. In addition, all living organisms have an evolutionary history, meaning that um, we come from uh, ancestors who are similar to us, but if we go back far enough along our family tree, we may find that those very distant ancestors aren't uh, as familiar looking, let's say, as uh, as the people around us are in this day and age, all right? So all of these things, um, these six items that we've listed here are the characteristics of life. 
And uh, the rest of this particular video will go through um, each of those and talk about the important aspects of all of them. Okay, so let's start with the first one, all right? Life is organized. Now this, uh, the picture that you see on this slide comes right out of your book. And, I, and depending upon the screen that you're using to look at this, I know that uh, the writing in the uh, grayish blue portion along the left-hand side of the picture is probably not um, all that readable for you, all right? unless you've got a, a, a good sized desktop. But what you should see in the picture is that starting down here, um, we're starting at the atomic level, all right? And an atom is the smallest unit of an element. Um, and there are a little over 100 elements on the periodic table of the elements, all composed of different combinations of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Atoms are not alive, all right? And yet, everything that is alive is composed of atoms. And so uh, when we start uh, the course in the next chapter, the first thing that we're going to talk about is chemistry, the chemistry of life. We then move up to the molecular level, which is when we combine atoms of two or more different types into a molecule. Um, now, the first living uh, portion of this are, is the cellular level. And the cell is the structural and functional unit, the most basic structural and functional unit of uh, all living things, all right? Um, cells can be organized into tissues, all right, which are groups of cells that have a common structure and function. Tissues are organized into organs, uh, which are composed of tissues that function together to, to perform a specific task. Um, organs can be organized into organ systems, which are several organ, uh, organs that work together and then all of your organs produce an organism. And so we've finally gotten to the human, right? And you can see a picture of the human right here. But of course, other organisms are alive and, and well as, as well, like the trees in this picture. Uh, populations are organisms of the same species that live in a particular area. A community are all of the interacting populations. So in, in this picture here, you've got the people, the trees, the zebras, every living thing is part of the community. And then uh, the ecosystem is the community plus all of the non-living things, the physical environment, the, the, the water, the rocks, the air, and that sort of thing. That's an ecosystem. And then finally, we get up to the biosphere, which is uh, the region of the earth, uh, literally on the surface of the earth um, and the waters uh, where living things exist. Okay. Now, moving on to our next uh, topic or next uh, uh, bullet point there on the characteristics of life. We have uh, that living organisms must acquire materials and energy. Now, this little beautiful girl is my daughter, Auden. And this picture was taken on a date night at a pizzeria Uno's, all right? Now, what Auden is doing right there is she is creating her own pizza, all right? She's got a, uh, a crust there and she's got a bowl of tomato sauce and a bowl of cheese. Now, what she's gonna do with this is she's gonna create a pizza and then she's going to eat it, all right? And um, in eating it, she will take in materials from her environment and she will add them to her own cells and tissues and therefore will grow. All right, this picture was probably taken five or six years ago. Um, she's now 13 and, and much bigger than she, she looks in this picture. Um, now, um, animals, of course, like humans, like all uh, animals, have to take in their energy by eating other organisms. And if you look at the, or at least uh, pr products that other organisms have made. If you look at this, um, the bread is composed of, of uh, wheat and yeast. All right, these are living organisms. The tomato sauce is composed of tomatoes and herbs and spices. I don't know what else was in there. Um, and the cheese is, of course, a, a product of um, cattle milk. Right, is is converted into cheese. And so all of those things on her plate there 
were once alive. As a matter of fact, everything that you eat was once alive, unless you're in the habit of eating, you know, pennies and nickels, um, which is not a good idea. Um, plants uh, acquire materials and energy in a different sort of way. They take in um, nutrients, some nutrients and uh, water from their roots in the soil, but they absorb energy specifically from the sun and they go through a process called photosynthesis, which allows them to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere along with water out of the ground and create sugars, all right? And that allows them to grow. So organisms acquire materials and energy from their environment, whether we're talking animals or plants, but even fungi and um, bacteria uh, and protists as well. The next one on the list was organisms have to maintain homeostasis. Now, there are a gazillion different examples of homeostasis out there, and you maintain homeostasis all of the time. Um, it, the example that's shown here on the screen shows uh, body temperature. And so we start with a, uh, a balanced body temperature, and you can see it right here on the little teeter-totter. Now, if for some reason your body temperature gets up to be above normal, uh, whether it's because you are exercising, whether it's because you're out in, a, in the hot sun, whether it's because uh, you've got a fever, it doesn't really matter. But if your body temperature goes up, we call that a stimulus. And the stimulus will be received by your brain, which is the control center of your body. And then the brain will direct a response to the stimulus. Now, in the case of overheating, for whatever reason, the response is that your blood vessels uh, will begin to dilate. In other words, in your skin, in your arms and face and, and that sort of thing, the blood vessels will go from a narrow diameter to a much greater diameter. And when that happens, all that hot blood comes to the surface and is then released out into the atmosphere, well, into the environment. In addition, you may also begin to sweat. And the evaporation of the sweat from your skin is a cooling process. And then eventually your body will return to the normal body temperature. Conversely, if you get too cold for whatever reason, you, uh, the stimulus there will go to the control center and the response here will be to have your blood vessels constrict to keep the hot blood in your core as opposed to uh, near the surface. And it will keep you, um, keep your body heat internal to the environment, or, well, away from the environment. And in addition, uh, you'll stop sweating if you were sweating at all. And so in both of these cases, you have uh, a scenario where the response to the stimulus is to reverse the stimulus or, or cut it back down, all right? We'll come back to that in, uh, in just a few minutes. Okay. Organisms have to respond to stimuli. I gave you an example the, uh, earlier of, you know, what would happen if I, if I threw a tennis ball to you? Well, or, or whatever I said, um, you know, you'll either reach up to catch it or you will, um, you'll duck and, and try to get out of the way, all right? That's a stimulus. You put your hand on a hot stove, you, you remove it, all right, because you respond. And all organisms have to have the ability, at least in some degree, to respond to stimuli. You may be familiar from a psychology class of the example of, of Pavlov's dog. And the little cartoon that you see here on the screen illustrates uh, what's going on. All right, before um, the dogs were conditioned, they were shown food and they began it's to... It's 2 o'clock. Well, thank you, Jesus. Um, they begin to salivate. All right. Um, and if they hear a bell ringing, they just kind of look around and there was no real response. However, what Pavlov did, what did was he associated the, the sound of the ringing bell with the, the uh, presentation of food. And so the dogs would begin to salivate because they saw the food. And as he continued to do this, eventually he could just ring the bell and not present food and the dog would still begin to salivate because he, he, they, the dog associated um, the sound of the bell with being fed, all right? And so that's a response. And you respond to your environment, both outside in the air and, and uh, environment, but also internally. 
All right. You know when you're hungry. You know when you're thirsty. Right. What do you do? You go get a drink. You go get some food. You that kind of thing. And so you're responding to both internal and external stimuli all the time. Next, uh, organisms reproduce and grow. We know that obviously that this is true. Um, you started out as a single fertilized cell, and you can see that a picture of this right here. And we'll talk about this in much greater detail when we get to the unit on reproduction. But that single cell divided and then divided again and divided again and divided again, and eventually implanted in your mother's womb and uh, eventually became the person that you see right here. All right. This is a picture of an embryo, uh, actually a fetus rather, um, that is about seven or so months old. All right. Um, but you can see, obviously, it looks very human, um, very small human, but it looks very human. Um, now, reproduction is not necessary for the survival of an individual, but it is necessary for the survival of a species. Okay. But all organisms grow, regardless of whether they, they actually reproduce. Organisms, uh, finally, have an evolutionary history. And so um, the, uh, this is the family tree of uh, modern horses. All right? And starting about 60 million years ago, horses were a four-toed, uh, organism. You can see the, the skeleton of their feet here. Um, and very, very small in stature. They were no bigger than, I don't know, maybe a, a poodle, um, a standard poodle, not, a, not one of the little teacup kind of things, but a standard poodle or so. Um, over the course of 20 to 40 uh, million years, they began to increase in stature and eventually they, their toes became balanced out so that they centered on one toe in the middle and had two toes on the outside. At around 25 million years ago, um, that one middle toe became very, very enlarged and the two um, toes on either side of it began to decrease in size considerably. And again, over the course of that uh, 40 million years or so, the tooth size and shape began to change as well. It was only about 7 million years ago that uh, Pliohippus um, actually became the first one, whoops, one toed horse. Um, and uh, it was only three million years ago that the modern horse appeared on the scene. Okay, and of course, obviously, the the uh, modern horse ha is a one-toed organism uh, with very large teeth designed for grinding up uh, plant matter that they then take in in order to provide themselves with energy and materials for growth. Okay, now. There's lots of living organisms on the earth, okay? Lots and lots and lots. So how are they classified? Well, there are um, three major groups that we call domains here. And if you look at our family tree, the evolutionary tree, the there was a common ancestor somewhere way back about between three and a half and four billion years ago, a single celled organism. And uh, they evolved and diverged and became uh, what we call today the bacteria. Now, bacteria are tiny single celled organisms, uh, very simple in terms of their structure. Um, and, you know, we always think of bacteria as making us sick, but that's not really the case. There are lots of bacteria that are quite beneficial to us. There are also the archaea, which were a branch off of that evolutionary tree. And these guys are very similar to bacteria, very small, very simple, uh, but they tend to be found in very harsh environments, very salty, very warm environments often. Um, the third domain are the, uh, the eukaryotes. These guys are what we call prokaryotes, um, meaning that they, before the nucleus, they didn't have, they don't have in their cells true organelles, true nuclei. The eukaryotic organisms do have nuclei, and cellularly, they are much, much bigger. Even though a protist 
<coughs> For example, a protist is a single-celled organism, but each cell is about 20 times bigger than your standard average bacteria. All right. They are much more complex in that they have a great number of organelles inside of them, each of which can, uh, contributes uh, very specific uh, materials and tasks to the organism. Uh, plants are um, multicellular organisms, uh, as are fungi and animals. So these are the most, the plants, fungi, and animals are the most complex of the organisms. Now, plants are photosynthetic. They uh, produce their own food using energy that they get from sunlight. Okay. Fungi and animals are both um, heterotrophs. And what that means is that they get uh, nutrients from the external environment. Now, fungi release enzymes into their environment and dissolve the, the food outside of their bodies and then absorb the nutrients into themselves. Animals, on the other hand, uh, ingest food. We eat it and digest it internally. The other major difference, of, of course, between plants, fungi, and animals is that uh, plants and fungi are non-mobile. They live uh, wherever they uh, land, um, whereas animals, uh, at least at certain stages of their lives, have the ability to move from one place to another. Okay. Now, if you look at the evolutionary tree, you can see where the branches uh, branching took uh, took place. Um, the uh, uh, branch that led to the protists uh, was about. Um, 1.75 million years ago, the branch that led to the plants branched off at about 1.5 ish million years ago, and the branch that uh, diverged the fungi from the animals was only about 1 billion years ago. Okay, now what makes human beings so special? All right, well, of course, you know, we think we're special because we are human, right? Um, and so this makes us, uh, different all right but we are distinguished from the other apes in a number of different ways first we have very highly developed brains now that's not to say that the other apes don't have highly developed brains and other animals too uh, dolphins and whatnot um but that gives us the um the uh ability to reason and and uh, uh tease out cause and effect relationships all right. Um, the uh, we also stand completely upright. We are the only organism that is truly bipedal. In other words, we, we stand completely straight up and down. All of the great apes, the other great apes, uh, walk uh, quadrupedally. They uh, they kind of knuckle walk, um, you know, leaning over and, and walking on their hands. We have creative language skills, right? We speak um, language. Right? Uh, obviously, I'm speaking English right now, uh, but there are many different languages all around the world, of course. And we have this ability because of our ability to move our lips in certain uh, uh, shapes and um, because of the ability to, for us to move our tongue in certain ways. We have the ability also to use a wide variety of tools. All right. You know, you can think of, of the standard tools like a hammer and saw and screwdriver and that sort of thing. But, you know, even the computer or phone that you're looking at right now is uh, a tool. All right. Um, we have a cultural heritage or patterns of behavior that are passed from one generation to the next. All right. Um, ask yourself this, who is George Washington? Well, all of you can probably tell me that he was the first president of the United States, but how do you know that? Did you ever, did you know George Washington? Did you ever meet George Washington? No. All right. We know this because uh, information and knowledge has been passed down from one generation to the next. Um, and we've kept track of our own history. All right. Uh, a pack of wolves um, does not remember what the pack of wolves looked like two generations ago. They might have met their grandparents, but they don't 
um, they certainly didn't meet their great grandparents. All right. You may not have met them either, but you can trace them. You know who they are because of the stories that your family has told you. All right. So we have this cultural um, uh, heritage that we pass from one generation to the next. And finally, we have the ability to modify the environment for our own purpose. All right. Um, and so the um, this ability is something that uh, we often take for granted. But, you know, on a cold winter's day in Albany, you know, we have the ability to turn the thermostat up and, and make our houses uh, be 75 degrees. On a 90 degree day, we have the ability to go to the thermostat and, and make turn our houses to to, you know, down to 75 or whatever you set the thermostat at. Um, we can build buildings and, and uh, do a number of different things that allow us to modify our environment for our own purposes. Okay, so that, my friends, is the first of two videos on chapter one. All right, I'll post the link for both of these videos um, in Canvas, and uh, I hope that you watch both and uh, pay very close attention. All right, I hope this first video wasn't too boring, um, and uh, let's move on to the next one.